Hub Hopper Originals. To start your podcast for free, log on to studio.hubhopper.com. Hello everyone and welcome back to Indian Genes. We have a very special and timely episode for you today as you would have been reading or listening to in the news. The US intelligence community has now released their much awaited UFO report on what it knows about a series of mysterious flying objects that have been seen moving through restricted military airspace over the last several decades. A lot of you have been sending us request that you were interested in this and wanted to know a little bit more. In order to try to answer these questions, our guest today is exactly the person you want to be listening to. Since 2001, he has been the senior astronomer at the SETI Institute, a not-for-profit organization whose mission is to explore, understand, and explain the origin, nature, and prevalence of life in the universe. He has a PhD in astrophysics from Caltech and has been awarded the Carl Sagan Award for the popularization of science. So to all our listeners, sit back and relax. This is an extremely exciting episode with none other than Seth Shostak from SETI. So Seth, first of all, from everybody at Indian Genes, a big welcome to you and an absolute pleasure to have you here talking to us. It's a Thank pleasure to be here. Thank you for sparing time to do this with us. I guess this talk is just so timely because we've been getting a lot of feedback from our listeners is there life out there and in the current scenario there are there's another question if there is life out there is it coming here so before we get to that exciting part of it for our listeners who've uh, who've not got a chance to listen to you okay I'll well you, uh, uh, i am an that. astronomer by training and actually uh, by occupation I got interested in astronomy at quite a young age. I think I was age eight or nine. And by age 10, I had built a telescope. Now, I have many other interests and I've had many other jobs, but uh, I've always come back to astronomy. So now I'm working for the SETI Institute, S-E-T-I, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, S-E-T-I. It's almost my name, which is S-E-T-H, but that's a coincidence. And it's located here in the Silicon Valley of California, just south of San Francisco. And what do we do? Well, we use big antennas, we point them toward the sky, and we try and pick up signals. We try and eavesdrop on any extraterrestrials that might be out there. That is super interesting. And I like the way you said it, that I, I was wondering as well, when I was reading your name, Seth, and Seti, that is so cool because that rhymes and that seems to be an, an excellent uh, way of putting it all together. Since 1960, I guess, when Frank Drake first started or, or the first experiment was conducted in 1960, what has been the progress since then? And how would you, you know, put it in a yes, capsule well, for us? It's a, somewhat the embarrassing in a way, I suppose you could say that this experiment has run, as you note, since 1960. So that's more than six decades of looking. And we have yet to pick up a signal that is clearly you know, due to extraterrestrial transmitters. So you might say, well, gosh, why is that? I mean, maybe there aren't any aliens out there, but that wouldn't make too much sense because something we've learned in the past two dozen years is that planets, even planets like the Earth, are extraordinarily common. There could be hundreds of billions of cousins of the Earth out there just in our galaxy. And by the way, if you don't like our own galaxy, there are two trillion other galaxies you, you could consider, at least the ones we can see with our telescopes. So there's an enormous amount of opportunity for life and intelligent life, which is what we look for mostly. And uh, so we think they're out there. The fact that we haven't found them yet, I think that that just says we haven't looked hard enough and we don't maybe have enough sensitivity. And I think a great starting point also would be when we talk about life or looking for life is do we do all of us who are looking for life, there are different aspects of uh, science as far as the search for life is concerned. Do we have a definition that all of us can agree on on what is yeah. life? Well, is, understand we all that the definition, the well, put it this way, understand that looking for life is different from looking for intelligence, right? I mean, you know, we might find life on Mars, or at least indications that Mars once had life, maybe four billion years ago. I, I missed out on it, I guess. But 
you know, four billion years ago, there might have been microbes, bacteria-like beings on Mars, and we may find evidence for that with the Perseverance rover and other rovers that have been uh, going to Mars. That's life, and there are at least a half dozen other places in the solar system where we might find that kind of life. But if you're talking about intelligent life, that's much harder because it's probably much farther away. And uh, that's what uh, the SETI Institute also does and what I do. Now, do we have a definition of life? I mean, that's important because if you're going to send a probe to Mars or some of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn looking for biology, you better know what life is. And believe it or not, we don't have a good definition of life. You might say, oh, well, uh, life uh, metabolizes, it changes, it takes in energy and you know, changes it some way. Well, a lot of things do that. I mean, fire does that, actually. Fire also reproduces. Another characteristic you might say is for life. So, in fact, you know, we don't actually have a good definition of life. Is the COVID virus alive or is it not alive? It needs a living cell in order to reproduce. So we don't have that definition. You might say, well, it doesn't matter too much. Maybe. But if you're going to design an experiment to go to Mars and look for life, it helps to have a definition of what you're looking for. There have been some findings of fossilized proof of life that would have been there about three and a half billion years ago. And considering that the Earth is four and a half billion years, that's really early for life to have actually started. So if it started here that early, I don't know whether you look at it as, well, would it we be don't that difficult so. to start but somewhere But on the other else? hand, when you only have one example, and that's what we have, Earth. Earth has life, and it got started, as you say, somewhere between three and a half and four billion years ago, right? Uh, you know, when you get to four billion years, the, the, the evidence becomes kind of shaky. But certainly by three and a half billion years ago, there was life on Earth. That's very quick. I mean, it's like walking into a casino in Las Vegas and placing a bet and immediately winning a jackpot. And you might conclude from doing that, that by gosh, Bob, winning a jackpot is pretty darn easy. It didn't take me any time. That's one conclusion. But if you only had one example of that, you might also say you were really lucky, Bob. So we don't know whether Earth has been lucky or whether it's typical. Because it, it could be either way. And exactly like you said, there's only been one example. And to set the stage here for SETI, I think the Allen Array Telescope would be one of your ways of looking out there or telling everybody that unless we look, we'll never know. There's no point in just sitting back. We have to go out there and, yes, send probes is one part of it, but there may be some other civilization in the same bandwidth of as far as our technology is concerned and have not moved on further. Why not, right? And we yes, like the to Allen Telescope about the Array Allen is Telescope? located here in California, but it's it's not near San Francisco. And the reason for that is, you know, not because there's better food up there. You know, there isn't better food up there, but it's located in the Cascade Mountains, about <laughs> 500 kilometers north of San Francisco. And the reason it's up there is because it's in a region where there really aren't too many people. And as a result, there isn't too much interference from all the electronics that we have these days that would, you know, make the search much more complicated, difficult to do, because you would be picking up signals all the time and you wouldn't know if they were due to ET or whether they were due to the local residents. So that's where the telescope is located. And it consists of 42 relatively small telescopes, about six meters, 20 feet in diameter. And uh, we've been using that to try and find signals that would uh, tell us somebody's out there. And also, we we'll use other uh, instruments, like the Very Large Array in New Mexico. We'll be using that soon also to search for signals. Okay. And is the Allen Telescope Array, would the speed be one of the important components of it, considering that there have been other telescopes uh, trying to do the same well, thing Well, I think as well? the defining factor the for the Allen factor? Telescope Array is that we built it ourselves. And that means we own it. And <laughs> that's a big advantage. You don't have to, you know, ask for a, a yeah. couple of weeks of observing time on an existing radio telescope, an existing antenna. You can use the Allen Telescope Array night and day for as long as you want. And that's a big advantage. The speed of the search depends mostly on the speed of the computers you have. And uh, I think everybody is well aware that computers keep getting faster and faster with time, very quickly, in fact. It's kind of an exponential growth in speed. So that helps our search. And talking about telescopes, I don't think uh, you would have enjoyed what happened to the telescope in Puerto Rico recently. I think that would uh, that comes across as one of, uh, one of 
uh, situations that should have or could have been avoided, right? Well, the I don't know Arashiro if it could have been uh, it coming down. <laughs> if it could have been avoided, it would have been a great thing if it had been avoided. I used that telescope actually in the 1970s for studying galaxies, and uh, you know, it it was a relatively inexpensive. Well, that's not true. It was a uh, it was an expensive <laughs> telescope, but it was it was built in a natural bowl in the rock formations of Puerto Rico. And, uh, you know, it was a thousand feet across. You could hold two billion scoops of ice cream, I once calculated. But, you know, you wouldn't want to use that because ice cream in the tropics usually melts pretty quickly. Not too, not it, a, a little bit messy. But that telescope, because it was so big, you know, you could use it and with the knowledge that it could find very weak signals, right? And when it collapsed, I think everybody was surprised, not just the people at the telescope, because... You know, the cables that held everything together, they're, you know, they're, they're the size of your wrist. And there are many of them. And it, it just was remarkable that it fell. It would be like the Brooklyn Bridge falling. Uh, you wouldn't expect that to happen. I just want to check with you about how safe is it? And I think you know where I'm coming from or, or what I'm Im- implying here, that there have been a few people who've said, Let's not even send signals out there, should we? Like Stephen Hawking, for example. Let's just stay where we are. Yeah, well, to begin what, with... What are your views I mean, what, well, <laughs> Stephen Hawking only said about one sentence about this, but because it's Stephen Hawking, of course, people uh, listen very carefully to what he says. But the facts are that, really, no SETI experiments broadcast anything. We're not sending anything into space. We're just listening. So there isn't much danger there. You can, uh, you know, drive along the, uh, <laughs> the roads of town... Uh, tuning in to your favorite uh, radio station without any danger to you. You don't have to worry that because you tune somebody in, you know, they're going to jump into the car and start giving you a hard time. They don't know you've tuned them in, but we don't, you know, so we don't have that problem about danger. There have been people indeed, uh, besides Stephen Hawking, who've said, look, you don't know what's out there. And it, it might be that if you send messages into space, if you transmit to the sky, you might just tell some aggressive society that were here and they might send their interstellar battle wagons to earth and, you know, just flatten it all. Well, you know, I, you could either say, yeah, that makes sense or it doesn't make sense. But the facts are, no matter how you feel about this, we're broadcasting all the time. Anyhow, our television goes out into space and, you know, a more visible signal are our radars. So that includes the, uh, the radar set down at the Mumbai airport. And so that's broadcasting into space 24-7, and you wouldn't want to turn it off. Hmm. I guess this is one part of when people talk about us getting out there or trying to, for example, perseverance is on Mars at the moment, and we're hopefully the best and the easiest thing to do would be find an artifact, and then we are done. Yeah, if you, are you talking about pretty an much, artifact right? from something that was intelligent? Yeah, well, that's pretty unlikely, given that Correct. if there if there had ever been a technical civilization on Mars, you know, you wouldn't have to hunt around for artifacts. I mean, if if the Earth suddenly was wiped clean of all life or even just humanity, you know, you could come back millions of years, billions of years later, and you'd find all sorts of stuff left over, uh, you know, all the aluminum stuff. The steel would kind of rust away, but, you know, you would see mounds of, of uh, oxides of, of uh, iron all over the place. You, you, the, the remains of a big city would be unmistakable. So it's just not reasonable to assume that there was ever any sort of intelligent life, civilized life on Mars. But at one time, we did think about that when we, I, I think it was about maybe 100 years ago, when we looked and we found the canals and thought that this could be yes, well, that signs was a of some story, kind of intelligent uh, about, life. As you say, 100 years ago, really more. It was first announced about 150 years ago by an astronomer in Italy. Uh, his name was uh, Giovanni Scaparelli. I'm sure I mispronounced it, but he won't care now. Anyhow, and he was the director of the Milan Observatory, and he thought he saw these canals on Mars, straight lines crossing the the surface of Mars, canals that were used for agriculture. But as soon as we had, you know, better telescopes, uh, nobody else was able to find these things. Very few people were able to see them. And of course, we have spacecraft that have gone to Mars since then, beginning in 1964. And all you see are craters and, you know, deserts and stuff like that. There, there are no canals on Mars and there's no indication, you know, macro indication, something you could see if you were standing there. 
you, you wouldn't see any indications of life on Mars. And for that life, as we keep referring to it, the possibility of it being carbon-based or silicon-based has to be kept open as well because the way we evolved on this planet may not be the way another being well, evolves that's true. or another organism uh, You can't evolves. assume that they're carbon-based life forms, as they say on Star Trek. But it is true that there's a lot of carbon in the universe, and that has to do with the way stars uh, age, if you will. They produce a lot of carbon. Carbon is a very common element on the Earth. Uh, but so is silicon, right? There's a lot of silicon. But carbon uh, is a smaller atom than silicon. And uh, just for reasons that you'll learn in chemistry class, carbon makes very complex molecules, right? I mean, there, there are all sorts of molecules. I mean, you know, the, the sugars and all that stuff. And silicon doesn't do that. If you take carbon and you expose it to oxygen, you get carbon dioxide. Now, we all know about carbon dioxide. It's a, you know, a rather unfortunate greenhouse gas, but it's also useful for biology. Plants, you know, take in carbon dioxide, okay? But if you take silicon and expose it to oxygen, you may get silicon dioxide. But silicon dioxide is just sand. It's not very useful. No plants are eating sand, right? So there really is a difference between carbon and all the other elements of the periodic table. And while it really might not be the only way you can build life, it certainly seems to be the easiest way. What exactly would be an amazing wow moment? I, I say wow and I refer to the wow signal, of course. But what is this wow signal that you're looking for? Would it have to be something that's in a really narrow band? Or uh, has that even, have you come close yeah, well, to it's impossible to tell whether you've gotten kind of close. Signal? If you haven't found it, you haven't gotten close. Or maybe you have gotten close, but you don't know. Uh, but we do indeed look for signals that are narrow band. Now, that sounds a little bit technical, and it, it, it is in a way, but it just means that the signals are only over a very narrow range of frequencies, a particular spot on the radio dial. And when you think about it, you know, uh, back in the day when radios and televisions had tuning knobs, uh, you know, instead of everything being digital, you go from one broadcast station to another now by hitting a button, and you don't see that that's like turning a knob. In the old days, you'd, you might turn a knob on a radio to go to a different station. But each state and station had its own broadcast frequency. And it would broadcast only over a range of frequencies around that narrow frequency. For example, here in San Francisco, KGO radio, 810 kilohertz on the dial. So that's where you tune. Okay, so that's the kind of signals that only transmitters make. Quasars, pulsars, all these things, they're natural radio emitters in the, in the universe, but they're all over the dial. It doesn't matter where you're tuned. So that's how we determine whether a signal is from ET or it's just some natural radio source. And set in your book, Confessions of an Alien Hunter, which I have gone through and I must tell you, it, it, it was an amazing read, very entertaining. You've spoken about the possibility of whenever we do encounter the being let's say, not signals, but these beings, they may not really be the squishy, big-eyed creatures, right? You say that they would have invented super smart post-biological thinking machines and what we're going to be interacting with could be bots or could be something that they've sent forward yeah, and not that's really That's my them. opinion. I, I don't know that all my colleagues agree with me on this, but uh, it seems to me that what we are doing here in the 21st century is inventing machines that can think as well as we do. And that's a little scary in a way, because you might say, well, what kind of job am I going to get if the machines can do it better and they don't insist on a, you know, coffee break or going home for dinner or anything like that? And indeed, that's going to be a problem. But the facts are we yeah. are doing this. And I'm not too far from Stanford University here. They have a, a, a pretty sophisticated artificial intelligence group. And uh, I, I talked to the guy who heads up that group once. And I asked him whether we're going to have machines that can, you know, write great novels and stuff like that by 2050. In other words, you know, just 30 years from now. And uh, he said, yes. <laughs> and I, I don't know if he's right, but the, the, the facts are that sometime in this century, maybe not by 2050, sometime in this century, we will have machines that can think as well as humans. And the first thing you're going to ask that machine is design a machine that's smarter than you are. And very quickly, you'll have a machine that's smarter than all humans put together. I think that that's what the real aliens would be like. There'll be some sort of artificial intelligence, not biological intelligence. 
and I think operationally we're doing that at the moment with Perseverance on Mars with the probes that we've sent. So we've got about eight of those instruments conducting experiments currently, but that seems to be the natural way as the moment you start getting well, out of, uh, of, course, of probably your planet, it's right? it's important that the rovers sent to Mars, for example, have a lot of smarts, right? I mean, they're not artificial intelligence that's going to, you know, <laughs> going to teach your, your, your class or anything like that, but they are pretty smart for rovers. And that's important mm. because Mars is usually at a position in its orbit where it takes maybe 15 minutes to send a, uh, a message to the rover or to get a message back from the rover. So imagine that you're walking around in you know, some place you've never been before, and you have to ask all the time, can I take another step? Because you know the next step might lead you over a cliff or, or into a rock or something like that. And you have to send the message back. Here's a picture of what's in front of me. It takes 15 minutes to get to somebody. And then 15 minutes later, they say, no, go to the right, or yes, you can go forward, whatever. You know, that's incredibly slow. And uh, you'll, you'll never get anywhere. So the rovers themselves have to make those decisions. That's not true if they're on the moon, uh, on the moon because they're only a few seconds delay. But with Mars, it's it's many minutes. So that's a problem. Currently, we we just want to check with you. There's been if anybody is listening to the news, or even if you're not listening to the news, then I think we all know what's happening because there seems to be a sudden influx of information on extraterrestrial intelligence on the Navy signals that have been picked up recently. And if we just step back from this, because when this does happen, there's a lot of noise that comes in together. And I guess you would be the right person to tell us people who are not experts. You know, a couple of hundred billion cousins of Earth in our galaxy. It's hard to believe this is the only planet with life or even intelligent life. But, you know, I don't agree with the people who think that the aliens, or some aliens, are here, sailing around our skies in their flying saucers. Now, these Navy videos uh, show, you know, something intriguing, some hot objects there, because they're infrared cameras generally that they use, some, some very warm or hot objects apparently doing something odd, but it might not even be objects. I mean, it could be a problem with the cameras. The facts are, I don't see why the aliens would come tens or hundreds of light years to visit Earth and arrange things somehow that they can only be seen by U.S. Navy pilots. I mean, you know, and, and over water, too. They don't see them over land. So it, it doesn't make any sense. And it's ambiguous. That's the thing you really have to keep in mind. Is this absolutely definitive proof that aliens are in our atmosphere? And if so, you know, why don't they shut down all the airports and keep Air India from taking off. I mean, it sounds dangerous to me. If there are unknown things flying around, you don't want to have your own planes up in the air too. So while a, a third of all the people in the United States, and I think it's the same almost everywhere, about a third of the population, think that, you know, some of these UFOs really are alien craft, you will not find many scientists who agree. True. And what were your views or what, what did you think about the Oumuamua? This was the first object that was found in our solar system that clearly came from somebody else's solar system. And we know that on the basis of its orbit, the way it was moving around. It was clearly, you know, in an orbit that meant that it come, came from very far away. It's a little hard to determine from which other star system it came, but it wasn't our own. Now, mind you, we didn't know whether these things were very common or very rare. We'd only found one of them. But there are some scientists, in particular, uh, Avi Loeb, who was the chair of the astronomy department at Harvard University, and a very smart guy. Uh, Avi Loeb wrote a paper or two in which he said, look, this is probably not just a rock. This might be a bit of hardware from some alien society. And of course, there was a lot of publicity about this because, you know, Avi Loeb has credentials. And as they say, he's a very clever, very clever scientist. So the question is, well, was Oumuamua somebody else's spacecraft, or was it just a rock? And most of the people that work in the field of uh, asteroids and comets think it was just a rock. Avi Loeb disagrees. The, the bottom line here is that we're never going to know because uh, Oumuamua has already on its way out of the solar system at a speed that makes it impossible for us, with our even with our fastest rockets, 
to ever catch up to it. So we're never going to be able to get up close to it and see if it looks like an alien spacecraft. But it turns out as soon as we had the kind of telescopes that could find these things, we found more of them. So since then, there's been something called 2i Boroshoff. That's the name of the Russian amateur astronomer who found this thing. And that clearly is a, a dead comet or an asteroid. So we'll see more and more of these. And if the next 50 of them are all definitely rocks, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that Oumuamua was a rock too. Right. And you're absolutely right. We did uh, have the pleasure of speaking to Avi Loeb as well on this particular podcast. And he did echo uh, very similar thoughts to what you were saying. Now, getting back to the fact that you mentioned one in three people believe or hope that there are or we are visited. Now, there's a difference between saying we are visited or they're currently amongst us and living amongst us or abductions and sightings. That's different from somebody saying that, yes, okay, looking at the Frank Drake equation, the possibility of every star having having a planet, and then we're talking about the amount of life or the possibility of life being out there. It's obvious that, yes, we've got, you know, maybe one trillion planets in our galaxy itself. But what do you think is the reason for this fascination with uh, aliens and not the scientific way of looking at life out there, but being visited. This all ties in together and seems to have a narrative. In the United States, people love to believe in conspiracies, right? There, can, there have been conspiracies about the the death of uh, John Kennedy, President Kennedy, uh, back, uh, well, in the 19, early 1960s. Conspiracies about what happened to the World Trade Center, right? Uh, Americans love to think that their government is doing something evil. And, you know, for its part, the, the government occasionally does do something somewhat evil. But, you know, so we, we just love that idea. People don't trust the government here. And, and, you know, that's a very broad statement, but approximately true. Whereas in Europe, you know, that isn't the case. People do trust the government. So it's a, it's a different mentality. Remember, America was a pioneer society. So uh, a strong emphasis on individualism. So that's part of it. But I also think that we're kind of wired, if you will, to uh, like the idea of aliens, just like we're wired to like dinosaurs, to be interested in dinosaurs. A lot of kids are interested in dinosaurs. And you might ask, well, why? And I think that's because, you know, we are shaped by evolution to be interested in anything with big teeth, right? Because if you weren't, you know, you might not be around. So uh, we're interested in you know, I don't know, alligators and lions and tigers and, and, and you know, dinosaurs. Anything that's dangerous is, interests us. That's a natural result of evolution, I think. And I think it's also natural that we're interested in things, uh, other beings that might be competitors that might kill us or, you know, uh, just re take us away from our, our territory where we grow our food, whatever. We are interested in these sorts of beings because if we're not, we might be dead. So I think that the interest in, uh, interest in aliens derives from this natural interest in any competitors uh, that might be on the planet. Interesting. You brought up dinosaurs and evolution as well. So if it wasn't for evolution, of course, and then the dinosaurs, but there was a big event uh, with that, uh, and if that meteorite had not hit and the dinosaurs were not extinct, would we be here as intelligent beings? The dinosaurs were around for 150 million years. And that's almost 500 times longer than Homo sapiens has been around. The dinosaurs were very successful from a biological point of view, right? The, 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 the dinosaurs just kept going and going. I mean, there were new, new kinds of dinosaurs, but they were all dinosaurs for a very long time. And that's such a long time you do indeed have to ask, well, why didn't they get smart? And there's no real uh, answer to that. Uh, some of them, by the time they were wiped out by that rock 66 million years ago, some of them were pretty smart for animals, but, you know, they weren't writing books. So uh, that, you know, that begs the question, just because you're a successful species, does that mean you get smart? And we don't know the answer to that. Obviously, it happened for us. But if it hadn't happened for us, if the dinosaurs hadn't gone extinct, I think it's very likely there would be dinosaurs around today. And I think that would apply for dolphins as well, right? Because a lot of people talk about the growth in the dolphin brain and how it has evolved over years with uh, eco-sensing coming up quite later on in, in, their, in their lineage. But they've 
probably were intelligent much uh, earlier than us. Uh, they're still not smart enough to, you know, to to produce iron or steel or, you know, any of the things you'd need for a technological society. I think part of that is the fact that they're, you know, in the water all the time. And it's very hard to do these technological things when you're in, in the mm. oceans. But they're not the only critters that have gotten smarter. You know, octopuses are smarter than they, they used to be. And of course, you know, the great apes are all quite a bit smarter, but that's our own lineage. But, you know, it it seems that being smarter does help you to survive, at least if you're a social species. And all these animals that we've just been talking about, they are social species. So, I mean, crows, you know, birds, the certain birds are pretty smart. They can make tools out of twigs and so forth. And we always are amazed by that. But none of this intelligence is nearly uh, as impressive as the intelligence of Homo sapiens. We're having this discussion, and uh, as far as I can tell, the dolphins are not. <laughs> and the IQ factor specifically for the Homo sapiens, like you said, you have spoken about this before, where you've said that there are signals for, or, or there are there's some kind of, of fitness awards for us as evolution went on. Uh, encephalization quotient, EQ, as an Edward quote, EQ, uh, and and encephalization quotient. This is just a measure of how big your brain is, right? If you have a bigger brain, you figure, okay, maybe they're smarter. Now, just the size of the brain isn't the end of the story. I mean, whales have the biggest brains of anything on earth, and they too are not terribly clever, right? They don't write poetry, but it's the weight of the brain as a fraction of the weight of the whole animal that counts. That's the uh, encephalization quotient. So, you know, if you have a big brain, but you also have a very big body, the way the whales do, and maybe you don't score so high on the EQ scale. We score higher than any other animals by far on the EQ scale. So uh, here we are having this conversation. True. And when you look back, uh, Seth, at these years of you being involved with SETI, how is this going to play out if we do find intelligent life? Let's stick to intelligent life for the moment because well, how do you see that yeah, happening? Yeah, there, there are various ways what it is might your happen. Problems? Obviously, it might be that the kind of experiments that the SETI Institute does, where we use these big radio antennas, big radio telescopes to try and eavesdrop, to try and pick up signals from some other part of the galaxy, that might be the way we succeed. It could be that one day we pick up a signal. Now, it won't be like in the movies where everybody jumps up and down, and starts screaming. But, you know, it's a very slow process because we pick up signals all the time. And you have to go through those signals and decide whether it's really ET or whether it's just interference from our own activities. So it would take almost a week, I think, before you'd be sure that you'd be sure enough to call up the newspapers <laughs> The problem is they'll be calling you the whole time because there's no secrecy here. But in any case, it, you know, it would be a big story. Now, would people ride in the streets and not go to work? I don't think so. One third of the public already believes that, uh, you know, the, some of the UFOs are alien craft and they still go to work. So uh, I don't think that there would be mass panic, but it would be very interesting. And some people would like to probably transmit something back to them, you know, along the lines of, hey, we're the earthlings and uh, we're here to talk to you guys and uh, tell us whether you like to buy some of our used cars or something like that. <laughs> and do you have a protocol for that if it does happen? Because we were talking earlier about the conspiracy aspect of it. Well, the other part of the conspiracy is it may already have happened, but it has been held as a secret. Now, if that is a conspiracy, but that could happen in the future again. Uh, for a long time, I chaired the committee that... Uh, uh, concerns itself with these things. But the protocols are not particularly surprising. I mean, the protocols just say three things. One, if you find a signal, check it. Well, of course you do that. I mean, that's just, that's just science. The second part of the protocol says, uh, tell everybody. Well, that would happen too, because as I say, uh, there's no secrecy in this work. So, you know, everybody would know anyhow. And the third thing says, don't broadcast anything back until you've had some sort of international consultation so that one country doesn't monopolize the conversation, if there's going to be any conversation. Uh, that That's the only interesting part of the protocols, but it's unclear what international consultation means. You know, does that mean that you first have to ask the 
Hyderabad cricket team, whether we can broadcast something back. I mean, what does it mean? Nobody even knows. But uh, although there are these protocols, you shouldn't expect that anybody's going to follow them. If we pick up a signal, everybody will know about it right away. And there will be some people who will use a backyard antenna and a transmitter and try and broadcast their own personal ideas to the aliens. I don't think you can stop that. Mm. And that is if, assuming that either SETI or some organization finds it, but there is a precedent in science where people have been looking for something and have found something that they are not looking for. So the possibility of this signal being picked up by an amateur. What the amateurs do not have is A, a lot of sensitivity. Their antennas are usually pretty small. And B, they don't have a procedure in place and equipment for deciding whether this is really ET or whether it's just, you know, some some radio station or airplane broadcasting radar or an Earth satellite sending data back to Earth. They have to be able to determine whether the signal is really from the sky, uh, from, from another part of the, the galaxy. And generally speaking, they can't do that. So I'm not so worried about that. But it is possible that, uh, you know, uh, astronomers just looking for things that have nothing to do with ET may see something that's so unusual, it could only have been built, if you will, by uh, an advanced intelligence. That's possible. Over these years, Seth, has there been a moment where you thought that this could be it, or you were really excited about a particular discovery, a news, a signal, at any moment that you yes, there was. We, we had a uh, we picked up a signal in 1997 that uh, had us sitting up all night looking at the computer screens because it looked like it might be the real thing, and uh, it was an exciting. I don't know. I think it was mostly, uh, I don't know, not upset, but I was uncomfortable because it meant that everything I had scheduled for the next week had to be changed, had to be canceled or moved. And I was worrying about that instead of thinking, wow, we finally found them. <laughs> but uh, for a while, at least about 24 hours, it looked like the real signal that we were looking for. It turned out it was uh, intelligence behind that signal, but it was earthly intelligence. It was uh, telecommunications back from the SOHO satellite. That's a solar research satellite built by the Americans and the Europeans. And uh, so it was sending data back, and that's what it was. Right. And internationally, Seth, how connected are we with this kind of data or information? So in any scientific field, there is a sharing of information or whenever this happens. Now, if we get back to countries like, for example, America or, or India and Russia and China, do is there some kind of a pact or understanding, or do you all guys share this information or knowledge with fellow colleagues who are doing the same thing? That's a pretty small number of people. I think the local, you know, fast food hamburger stand here in Mountain View, California, has more people working in it than, you know, than, than we do, right? And in the entire world, the total number of people might be 20, right? And as it turns out these days, uh, they're all here in the San Francisco Bay Area. That's kind of a coincidence, but not entirely. It's because the University of California at Berkeley is here. And also, a Russian billionaire who is interested in the subject, and he's the one who's su the, supporting the, the project now. So it's, it's not government money. So, uh, you know, it's it's true that we all know one another because we've, we've seen one another at conferences, we're working in the same field. There's a lot of communication. We don't share data because it's too hard to share data. And the, the data would fill up your hard drive very quickly inside of a day. So, you know, you can't you can't share it. I mean, we just don't have the money to, to actually share it. But that doesn't matter. Everybody does their own experiment. And if one of the experiments succeeds, then, you know, the other people in this field would immediately try and confirm that they had really picked up a, an interesting signal. So uh, there's no sharing in general. But in case of a detection, yes, very much so. And set a lot of people listening to us today are students, school students, university students, and people who are just building their careers and deciding which way to go. Uh, I have two aspects here, two parts of this question. The first would be, we spoke a lot about how to think right in the sense of conspiracies uh, or facts. How would, what would your advice to these young kids listening to you be? And I have to say, when I was younger, I probably wouldn't be even interested in any advice given to me by an adult. But I will say 
I mean, if you find this interesting, you can hmm. find lots of information about it by just searching the web or going to the local library. I mean, there's been lots of stuff written about this. But beyond that, if you're, you'd like to do it, you know, uh, if, if it interests you enough to make a career out of it, there are no secret, uh, you know, uh, uh, formulae for success. I mean, that, that's just not the way it works. You just study, you know, one of the sciences, whether it's, well, in my case, it was physics and astronomy. But in many of the people that work for me, it would be, or work with me, I should say, uh, they've studied geology or biology, right, or electronic engineering or computer science. These are all fields that play a role in the search for life and for extraterrestrial intelligence. So if you, uh, you know, you follow your interests, what interests you the most, and you study that, and uh, studying it means probably going to grad school too, um, then, you know, there, are, there aren't many jobs. It's like being, being an astronaut. There aren't many jobs, but uh, there are some jobs. And, uh, you know, young people who find it interesting shouldn't, shouldn't be discouraged. They should just follow what really excites them. Thank you so much for that. And as a science communicator, as well said, uh, said you also run the big picture science podcast. And, and that's something that I've been following as well. You've got an amazing, amazing uh, array of episodes there. And I think your, la your last one was very interesting where you spoke about air apparent, right? Where uh, dogs, uh, the ability for dogs to sniff and, and what they actually are getting through the atmosphere. You've covered topics on bipedalism. You've also spoken about skepticism and and migration and conservation. Tell us a little bit more about that. I've been doing this radio show and podcast for, you know, like a dozen years, in fact. But the real reason I do it goes back quite a ways to when I was 13 years old, I think. Uh, and I was in a science class in what we call junior high school, probably call it middle school now. And uh, the teacher wasn't very interesting. It was kind of boring. And I kept wondering, why, why can't he make this interesting? Because after all, the subject was very interesting, but somehow couldn't make it interesting. And so, uh, you know, I, I think it's a consequence of that. I find it very uh, it, really exciting, but also gratifying to go talk to a classroom of uh, young people and see them light up when they hear something that explains something they'd always seen in their lives but didn't really understand. That's the beauty of science. It can explain things, right? You know, there are a lot of other things that uh, may not explain anything. It, but that, that isn't to say that they're, they're not worthwhile. I mean, I go to the movies plenty, and they don't explain much. But, you know, the science does explain things. And so that's the reason that we do this podcast, broadcasts on both stations and, and uh, a podcast, because, you know, it's just I think it's really altruistic. That's a dangerous word for me to use, but it's just interesting to me to see people get interested when they finally understand something that they had watched all their lives and now really saw that there was a reason for it. Right, and I'm sure you've been in touch with, or you must be in touch with uh, the media as well as far as your podcast is concerned. But looking back at the SETI story, uh, has there been any other production or movie like the one that came out with Jodie Foster and we all know Contact? I actually consult for Hollywood on occasion, so I've been involved with some of those things. Uh, you know, they, they, they might want to get the science right, or at least more right. So, you know, they'll call me up or they'll fly me down to Los Angeles or whatever, that kind of thing. Uh, there are a lot of movies, as I say, that involve aliens, and most of them aren't very accurate in terms of the science. But, hey, they don't have to be accurate. In my opinion, it's good that they're they're interesting, that they're the kind of movies you might want to see because they might get you interested in a subject. I think that's the, the most you can expect from a movie. It might get you interested in some subject. And so, you know, I, I encourage that. The media pay quite a bit of attention to SETI and the search for life. Uh, the past week, it's all been about the Navy videos and UFOs. So, uh, you know, I've been on a lot of radio shows, and yeah. TV shows for that. But, you know, that, that's something special. But in general, yes, the media are interested in the search for life because people are interested in the search for life. Mm. And if we had to, as we wind, wind down here, I know your time is limited. If we had to ask you, which was your favorite movie? Science oh, fiction, those would be the would, movies I saw when I was, you know, 10 or 11 years old. 
I mean, you know, those are the ones that had the biggest effect because when you're that young, to begin with, uh, anything you see on the screen is a possibility from your point of view. You don't realize that it was all special effects or, or these are mm -hmm. actors or anything like that. You just think, oh, this could be true. And not only that, these, these films could take you to worlds you'd never been to or could never go to. And that's certainly very exciting. That's something the movies can do that uh, very few other media can really do. Uh, they can take you to some place far away or in a galaxy long ago or whatever. And some of them are just sort of fantasies in space. Star Wars is like that. But others actually, you know, try and address some possibility in science. And usually if it involves aliens, the aliens come to Earth because, you know, the producers think that's more interesting. And what they their first uh, the first item on their to do list is always to flatten Los Angeles. Now, I live here in Northern California, so it's okay if they want to flatten Los Angeles. It doesn't bother me terribly much. But, you know, they usually make a, the aliens the bad guys. And, and maybe they would be bad guys. Some of them would probably be bad guys, but not necessarily the ones that come here. I don't think any of them are going to come here. But, you know, it's, it's certainly useful uh, beyond entertainment. It's useful in getting people, particularly young people, interested. My favorite films were all the ones that I saw, as I say, between the ages of 10 and 12. Uh, Seth, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you, and we have to let you go. But before you go, is there something you want to tell our audience if people are looking for you? I would just say you could go to SETI.org as an organization, and there's a lot of stuff there. Or you can listen to our podcast at Big Picture Science, all one word, BigPictureScience.org. Uh, there's, there's plenty of stuff there if you look in the archives you find many, many subjects. Uh, but as I say, the, the thing to do is, I mean, it's very easy to find information now, uh, thanks to the web. And, it, you know, it, uh, it wasn't so easy when I was younger, but you, you, can, you can do that. And I encourage you to do that. True, we will do that. And Seth, you are very busy and uh, most wanted at the moment. I do know you have a lot of uh, media coverage and interview schedule. So thank you so much for taking time to speak to us once again and hopefully we can do this again set once this once the signals stop and these uh, uh, the, the the frenzy around it dies off maybe we can have a longer talk. chat if love you to are talk okay to particularly young people and I know there's a lot of young people on the other end of this broadcast thank you thank you so much this hub hopper original ko sunne ke liye aapka shukriya अगर आप भी अपना पॉडकास्ट लॉन्च करना चाहते हैं तो हब हॉपर स्टूडियो वेबसाइट पे रजिस्टर करें और एक मिनट के अंदर अंदर अपना खुद का पॉडकास्ट लॉन्च करें यही नहीं स्टूडियो देता है आपको पूरी आजादी कहीं भी कभी भी अपना पॉडकास्ट लॉन्च करने की सिर्फ तीन आसान स्टेप्स में तो साथ में अपना पॉडकास्ट शुरू करने के लिए तैयार जस्ट हॉप ऑन हब हॉपर सिंपली कॉन्टेंट